It was 5.45 a.m. I put on my blue Walmart vest and got ready for another grueling day. While others were probably having a good time enjoying their weekends, I was stuck at work. Yet again, another day of putting up fake smiles and making up nice words. It had been a year in the general merchandising unit and my patience and enthusiasm for the job had gradually dropped to the absolute zeros. I had to be out there, showing all my teeth, pretending to be helpful to customers who were most of the time unappreciative. Cool, right? Changing the world one crazy smile at a time. Let's do it, I said to myself as I took one last look in the bathroom mirror before heading out. The cleaners were almost done with the aisles. In no time, we were expecting people, gathering hordes for the massive weekend sale, while I was not expecting my colleagues to show up any time now. At least I could tease them for showing up late. She got feelings for me, Rick said, ecstatically stroking his beard. Quarter past eight, and the building was buzzing. One could get lost in the sea of people gathering. I had just closed a couple of deals, and I was in the cereal aisle chatting with Rick. You better not set yourself up for heartbreak. You're going to get crushed, I gloated. We were laying claims on one of our beautiful and fit female colleagues. What the hell are you doing here? The head of the unit interrupted our mild debate with an even more superior claim. No bueno, Rick said under his breath. Get your asses going. Come on, he said. James, you go check on what that woman wants. He pointed to a mildly aged, overly plus sized woman who seemed to be at most 50. Obediently, I dragged myself to the scene, winking at Rick. We were far from through with our debate. Good day, ma'am, I forced a smile that defined my personality. How can I be of service to you? How I hated those words. She seemed to have a slight smile on her face, but when she looked up to see me, the smile disappeared. She didn't say a single word. She just continued scrambling for something that she obviously didn't know where it was. Uh, what are you looking for, ma'am? Uh, I can help you get it in no time. I became impatient, and my smile faded as well. Still no response. This woman was obviously lost. Uh, ma'am, if you could... Who's in charge? She cut me off with a rude snarl with an irritated look on her face. I want to speak to who's in charge. At that point, I knew I was in for a bad day. Ma'am, calm down. Uh, there's no need for that. Just tell me what you need and I'll get it. And I said to get me your boss. Her cheeks grew red. Are you deaf, asshole? She retorted. I still tried to maintain a nice employee composure as I absorbed that. There's no need for that, ma'am. My tone was less cordial. Good gracious, do I need to spell it out? Get me your boss. Her face reddened even more as her voice got louder. She sighed in disappointment. I'm not getting anywhere with this douchebag. When did Walmart become an employment opportunity for the low lives and addle brains? I took another verbal hit. I began boiling on the inside. Just like I was told in anger therapy, I began taking deep breaths hoping to get through this without another fit of rage. Ma'am, calm down. I spoke more argumentatively, trying to reason with the tantrum throwing Karen in front of me. Get me your boss, you numbnuts, she screamed. Fortunately for her, the head of my unit showed up. I knew he would side with the lady. What's the problem, ma'am? He tried sounding as polite and as nice as possible to ease the customer's anger. He gave me a displeased look. I waited with anger and desperation to know what she would say the problem was exactly. This moronic employee of yours wouldn't show me where to get my green tea, she complained, pointing at me accusingly. What the? I just couldn't take it anymore. That's not... Enough of that, James. My office. Now. My boss didn't want to hear anything I had to say. 
he had blindly sided with this irritating lady. For a moment, I wanted to hesitate and explain myself. I breathed in deep, sighed, and decided to be obedient for my job's sake. It had indeed become quite a scene, as everyone had drawn closer to see what this fat lady was ranting about. Muttonhead scum like you aren't supposed to be here. She lashed out at me one more time as I peacefully walked away from the scene. And that did it. The limit had been reached, the boiling point had been exceeded, and sparks were about to fly. What did you just say to me? I stopped and turned, not minding my boss's orders. Oh, you heard me right, scum, and you had better get... I couldn't wait for her to tell me to get going before I gave her a swinging right to the chin. There it was. My anger had found full expression. I knew there would be repercussions, but I just couldn't stand her anymore. No one could possibly stand such verbal abuse. I had tried my best to water down the fire, but she kept throwing logs into it, and she got burned real bad. A few seconds after this plus-sized woman hit the floor, two huge guys rounded me with hate in their eyes. I knew I was in trouble. Without warning, I was hit from the left, right, and center. Never again in your miserable life will you lay hands on an elderly lady, one of the men said as he stomped vigorously on my chest as I laid on the floor. I gasped in pain and anguish. At the juncture, my eyes were just about to shut by swelling around it and blood trickled down from my nose. I lost sensation in those areas for a split second. I got really scared as I had difficulty breathing and moving and my assailants weren't done. My right pinky had been broken and my face had been numbed in pain. It took a while before security were able to arrive at the scene, but the situation at hand was beyond what they could control. Scattered shelves and two yelling adults. My manager was nowhere to be seen, and these two were proving too much for security as well. Amidst the ruckus, I was able to slip away somewhere private. I knew I was going to be in trouble for this. If only that woman would have just shut up. I began wondering if she would be recovering anytime soon because that hit was really hard for an aged woman. But even worse, I was worried about myself. I hope I didn't sustain any fatal injuries or internal bleeding of any sort. James, good God! Rick found me crouching behind one of the shelves. The look on his face was enough to show how worried he was. What happened? Long story, I sighed. Please give me some ice. Ugh, I don't want to look like a pig when the police get here. He scurried off after I had spoken and soon returned with two bags of ice. That soothed my wounds for the moment. Police arrived soon. Despite my pitiful state, I was bundled roughly, then cuffed and stuffed into the police vehicle. They treated me like some armed gang leader. I was simply trying to fight for my rights. I was kept separately from the other men who had also been arrested. The next day, the other men were fined $200 and let off the hook. The crazy woman who I had knocked out cold had pressed charges against me for third degree assault. As a 20 year old on my own, I couldn't get a good lawyer. I ended up getting class A assault instead and sentenced to a year in prison and a fine of $1,000. A bit too much for me. I served my time and was eventually released, just a few days before my next birthday. I sighed in discontentment as I looked at the long line of customers I was still supposed to attend to. It was in moments like these that I knew, without a doubt, that I hated my job. I was 20 years old and after high school, life pretty much sucked for me. I was always an average student, so I knew that getting into college would be difficult for me. What I didn't count on was that I would become completely broke. After my dad died of a heart attack last year, my mom spiraled down into depression. She quit her job and we spent all the money that was left. I knew I had to take responsibility. I was the only child and there was no one else to help me. 
I started working part-time jobs to pay our bills and to get food on the table. This job at Walmart was the highest paying one I had ever gotten. It was stressful, but I didn't have a choice. I was feeling uneasy that day, and I couldn't wait for my shift to be over so I could go home. A middle-aged woman was next, and I quickly started to process her items. She shoved something in my face and said that the packaging was damaged and she wanted to return it. Upon closer inspection, I noticed that the box of chocolates was missing a few bars. I politely asked her if she ate it out of it, and she started fuming. She said that she ate a few pieces out of it because the box was already opened and it was defective. I took a deep breath and explained to her that she would have to pay for the chocolate too. Why? Are you trying to cheat me? This woman is trying to cheat me! She yelled. She turned behind her and gestured to the customers queuing at her back. Most of them just moved back a little bit, trying to mind their own business. <laughs> this wasn't my first time dealing with a problematic customer, and I knew what to do. I shoved all her things to one side and picked up the telephone to call the manager. She snatched the receiver and slammed it back down. I stared at her in shock for a few moments. She reached for something in the pile of items in front of me and pointed it at me. It was a knife, a new one, and no one had to tell me that it was very sharp. I swallowed. Ma'am, calm down. She grabbed my hair and yanked me forward. Someone tried to approach her from behind, and she slashed them with the knife. I heard a scream, but I couldn't look at what happened. The woman pulled me up and over the counter. She stayed behind me. I'm going to kill her, I swear. People started to scream and run towards the exit. Everywhere had descended into chaos. My manager ran out of his office with wide eyes and stopped suddenly when he saw the knife to my throat. It was bleeding a little. He tried to placate her and told her that she would have her things for free. I know my rights. I have a knife and I'm not afraid to use it. She cut me on my shoulder and I screamed. Blood was trickling down my arm and it felt like I was on fire. It really stung. My mind quieted and the only thing I could think about was that I was going to die before my life even had a chance to start. My body was trembling and I couldn't speak. My breaths were coming out in short bursts. She yelled at everyone to stay away from her or else I would bleed all over the Walmart floor. The cops were outside and started negotiating with her on a megaphone. The security agents had already ushered everyone else out of the Walmart. I was the only one left with this sick woman. She told my manager to let her out the back door into the parking lot. She dragged me with her as my manager rushed to open the door, still trying to plead with her. I whimpered as she dragged me across the parking lot. She shoved me into the trunk of her car and closed it. Darkness surrounded me as I tried to think of a way out. I pushed the trunk up with all of my might, but it wouldn't budge. The car jerked and we began to move. Where was she taking me? I knew that the woman needed help. I started crying in earnest now. Suddenly, the car came to a stop and the trunk opened above me. All you had to do was be a good girl. She spat in my face. Now you're going to suffer the consequences. Please, I choked out. She pointed the knife at me and told me to get out. I obliged and she forced me to my knees. My hands were tied behind me and my vision was blurry as a result of all of my tears. I didn't want to die. I watched her in fear, unsure of what was going to happen next. She was pacing in front of me, telling me that she had enough of little girls like me telling her what to do. That I was like her daughter who wanted to take her to seek help when she knew she didn't need it. I was afraid to even breathe loudly. I surveyed the surroundings of where we were carefully. It was some kind of park, and we were surrounded by trees. 
I looked back at her to make sure she didn't notice. She tossed the knife on the floor and ran her hands through her hair. She was muttering to herself, unhinged. Desperate, I lunged for the knife. In one quick move, I cut through the bindings before she could even take a step towards me. I yelled at her to leave me alone, but she kept coming towards me. I didn't think about what I was doing as I leapt on her, screaming like a banshee. Blood sprayed over my clothes and on my face as I stabbed her multiple times. I lost count of the number of times I yanked the knife out, only to plunge it back in. The sirens broke me out of my rage, and I crumbled to the ground helplessly as the cops surrounded me. They took me to jail, and I was told I would appear before a judge. They concluded that I only acted in self-defense and was trying to protect myself. Due to the violent nature of how I killed the woman, I was put on lockdown and had to see a psychiatrist every week. I couldn't leave my town thanks to the tracking device they put on me. The incident woke my mom up from her recluse lifestyle and she started to try to find a job to sustain us. I resented her. If she didn't leave me to fend for the family, I wouldn't have been in this predicament that almost killed me. Midnight snacking was never an option. I didn't fancy it, not because I didn't want to, but because of how it made me feel. It would seem good to munch on snacks, but the results were always bad. I would wake up feeling bloated and disgusted, as if I had committed some previous crime the night before. Over the past seven days, I had managed to maneuver my life towards a healthy lifestyle and had kept my hands away from the snacks. My streak was about to be broken when Tracy informed me about her plans for a sleepover at my place. Tracy was a lover of midnight snacks, and whenever she was around, I didn't mind, because I would lose my sleep, snack or not. Tracy became my best friend. I was a big lover of hamburgers, and so was Tracy. Because of this, our midnight snack was always from Wendy's. When Tracy arrived, we did a little chit-chat until a little later, and then she placed the order for the burgers. Tracy recently got a boyfriend, and I had been waiting all week to listen to the backstory in detail without omissions or pauses. It was the main reason she came for the sleepover. The best part of the sleepover was that we had the whole house to ourselves. My parents were away for the weekend, and that meant we had all the privacy in the world. It was also the reason why I knew that midnight snack or not, I wasn't getting any sleep. Halfway into her story, I concluded that it wasn't as juicy as I expected it to be. For a while, I was confused, wondering if the guy had made a move on Tracy at all, because from the way she narrated so far, it seemed like Tracy made all the moves. The rumor at school echoed to be true, and more than hearing the backstory. I was interested in what made Tracy fall in love with her new boyfriend, Harry. Harry was the ugliest guy of the school, while on the other hand, my friend Tracy was super sexy. According to me, she was simply toying with him, and it wasn't right. It was one of the little secrets I never shared with Tracy. It was no wonder though, Tracy had always been like that. A message popped up on Tracy's phone, and she declared the burger guy was here. The moment I saw the delivery man, or better call him delivery boy, I clearly understood the reason why my friend chose Harry. Well, Harry was the delivery boy standing at the door. Apparently, he was running errands to please her. As he gave the food packet to Tracy, he leaned in for a kiss, but Tracy slapped him in the face. For God's sakes, Harry, stop being so desperate and try to brush that stinky mouth of yours sometime. Now go away, I'm with my best friend. Well, to be honest, Harry was disgusting. He was like a tunnel rat, but that still didn't warn Tracy to be rude to him. Or was she right? I mean, how could he even think that she was going to kiss him, or even date him? You should eat that while thinking about me, he said, and I thought that was something about his voice that was weird. 
his lopsided smile too. Tracy nodded and shut the door. He didn't leave. I knew because I saw him through the side window staring into the house. Fifteen minutes had gone by and we were chatting and enjoying our snack, but I had this feeling that Harry was still somewhere around the house. Although I didn't see him, I could feel his presence. The fact that someone was watching. It's that same feeling when someone is staring at you when you're not looking, but you just know it. I couldn't mention it to Tracy. I didn't want her to think I was paranoid. After a bite, I pulled the remnant of the burger from my mouth to take a quick peek. At the same time, something sharp pricked the top of my tongue. As my mouth collapsed over the food in my mouth, it felt like a needle trying to pass through the soft tissue. I threw down the burger and cried in pain. Tracy ran towards me and the burger in her hand fell off, revealing a large dose of what resembled some sort of pills. We froze in our spots. Who did this? I wanted to ask, but the pain in my tongue inflicted more pain. I winced loudly, and she took hold of my chin, holding my mouth in place while she removed the office pin from my tongue. Blood filled my mouth. When it was successfully dislodged, I went to the sink and washed my mouth while Tracy checked the burger in my hand. The blood was still flowing. We realized that there were more pins. Fear gripped us. Never had this happened to us before. Never had we seen pills and pins in a burger, no matter how much we ate them. It had to be Harry. I stood up and ran towards the side window. He was staring into the house, just like he was waiting for something. Tracy joined me. Together, we saw the sly, disappointed smile that remained plastered on his face as he shook his head and walked away. We rushed out to meet him. Tracy dialed the emergency number as we went. He stopped in his tracks at the sound of our footsteps behind you. Why did you do it? Tracy asked before I could gather my words. Harry looked different with the sinister look on his face and the mischief that filled his eyes. He shrugged, nothing. He grinned and goosebumps covered my skin. I was really scared now. Harry was not only ugly, but with the darkness that enveloped the atmosphere and the silent whispers in the dead of night, he seemed like a monster. I just like the sight of blood. Like the little line tricking down your lips, Joan. He pointed towards me. I put my hand on my lip and felt the warm liquid. Are you out of your fucking mind? I thought you liked me, you ugly fuck, Tracy screamed. His eyes were cold as he stared at Tracy. I don't like you. I don't like how you made the entire school believe I was falling head over heels for you. I just wanted to get rid of you. Bitches like you need to be taught a lesson. Those pills, they would have made you unconscious. Then, I would have treated you like my actual girlfriend and I would have taken selfies to prove and show everyone at school. Tracy shivered as Harry spoke. But I don't have an ugly heart and won't stoop so low. Instead, I have a better plan. <laughs> Harry laughed, and that's when I saw the sharp blade in his hand. He took slow steps towards us. The sharpness of the blade reflected the moon, and for a while, I thought death was upon us. Tracy had messed up with the wrong guy this time. That was all I thought of. But just in time, the police arrived, and Psycho Harry was gone for good. After that incident, I broke up my friendship with Tracy. I had thought that the whole Harry thing would change her outlook towards life and make her a better person. But sadly, she was still the same. Mondays were hell. There was always too much to do at work and too little time to do it. I was always left feeling wretched and dead at the end of each day. 
It didn't help that my girlfriend also worked the same long hours as I did. That meant that at the end of the day, we were both too tired to make dinner. This was where Burger King delivery came in. We ordered two takeaway parks, and my girlfriend Sophia went out to collect the order. My stomach growled loudly. My hunger had intensified. I couldn't wait to devour the food. However, it seemed like the delivery guy was taking his sweet time. What's the holdup? I asked. He's getting it, Sophia replied. She already had the cash in her hands. Just as Sophia handed the cash and tried to collect the packet, a scrawny little dude snatched the takeaway from her. It was quick, like a flash. Hey, Sophia cried, stop! All of the frustration which I had endured at work broke free from the little mental cell where I'd locked them all up. Now they were all going to be let loose on the thieving idiot with our takeaways. Sophia and the delivery guy were still staring open-mouthed. The scrawny guy was fast, but I was faster. The takeaways he had in his hand were impeding his movement. A few meters down the block, he flung them away violently. Our dinner flew through the air and landed up splat on the road. Just as I feared, the packs didn't withstand the hit. The food poured out all over the asphalt. Just like that, the dinner Sophia and I had paid for was wasted. Now I was seeing red. My heart was pounding hard as I ran into the alleyway. It was when I was well over ten steps into it that I realized it was too dark for me to see well. I slowed down to look around. There was no sign of the scrawny guy. My panting was the only sound to be heard. I squinted hard into the darkness while I waited for my pupils to dilate and adapt. A rustle to my left, slightly behind me, intruded on the silence. I pivoted to take a look, and was instead blinded by a bright flash of light. Pain exploded in my skull and my center of gravity shifted. I hit the ground with a grunt and clutched at my head to keep the pain from tearing it apart. You should have let me go! A swoosh alerted me of an incoming blow just moments before it connected with my back. Only a club or a bat could inflict the amount of pain that seared through my side. I cried out in renewed agony and scrambled to my hands and knees to crawl away. Then another blow caught me in the head. This one threw me back to the ground. I'm hungry! Do you understand that? All I understood was the pain that was burning through my head and my side. I didn't understand anything else. I wasn't even sure who was talking. My easiest guess was that it was the scrawny guy. However, the voice was a deep rumble. Not something you'd expect from a guy as thin as he was. It was me or you, he continued. The food or your life! Darkness crowded in on me. This darkness was different from the darkest of the night. It was oblivion, dragging me down into its void where nothing had any meaning. On my bed, under the covers, and with Sophia resting her head on my chest, it would have been welcome. However, out here, in a dark alleyway, with my body racked with pain and a batshit crazy psycho attacking me, it was the last thing I needed. So I fought it with all the mental strength I could muster. You chose the food, didn't you? The crazy bastard asked me. Now you're going to die. No! I groaned and tried to get up from the ground, but my body had already sustained a lot of damage. My spirit was half broken too. As I stood up, my legs started to shake and I collapsed to the ground once more, a sickening fear ballooning out of the pit of my stomach. I knew another blow and I'd be dead for sure. I could hardly protect myself. I'll kill you, my attacker shouted. I'll barbecue your limbs right here and eat every last bit of flesh. Gone was all the rage that had driven me into this alleyway. In its place now was pain and pure terror. A heavy trail of warm liquid was making its way down the side of my face and the back of my neck. I didn't need anyone to tell me it was blood. I also didn't need anybody to tell me my hand was going to be useless for a while. The darkness was coming back again. A clink announced the presence of metal with a sharp edge. You hear that? The loony said. It's my knife. 
I'll slice the flesh off you bit by bit. <laughs> I wanted to beg for my life to convince the crazy loony that I could buy him as much food as he wanted if he just left me the hell alone. But I couldn't even muster the words. Not with the darkness weighing down heavily on me, dragging me under. Please, don't kill me. When I opened my eyes, and what seemed like ages later, it was only to see a place that looked like heaven. Everything was white. The walls, the bedsheets, the tables, my bandages. Even my girlfriend Sophia was dressed in a white gown. She stood across the room looking out a window. Soph? My voice was a barely audible croak. Unfortunately, it was sufficient to draw her attention. She turned and ran over to where I lay and sat on the edge of the bed. The depression in the bed brought me discomfort and I groaned. She jumped off of it immediately. Well, I'm sorry, I forgot. It was then that I realized that this wasn't heaven. There couldn't be any pain in heaven. What happened? I asked Sophia. The guy... He was arrested, she said, and her eyes clouded up. They said he's a psychopath, a hobo. He used to be a soldier, but then he lost it. I sighed, wondering how close I had been to death. He killed another guy that night, Sophia continued. Left one other guy half dead. It took half the neighborhood to put him down. Now the tears were running down her cheeks. Every single one of them was left with a wound. Now I knew how close I had been to death. I shuddered, completely horrified. But still, I thanked my stars for saving me. It was like a second life to me. The day started out peacefully. I had hopes for a good day, but it felt like a day when people would say they woke up on the right side of the bed. And I myself woke up on the right side of the bed, in a good mood. I didn't take out anger on the kids as I got them ready for school. My husband prepared breakfast, and I have never eaten anything more perfect. We had a nice time together that morning before he left for work, and I busied myself with a few chores before it was time for my shift at Costco. I was eager for a fruitful and productive day. What I didn't remember was that there was always a lull before the storm. I started my shift at Costco that afternoon with a cheery smile and residual energy from the way my day had started. The store was filled with customers. Seeing so many customers around irritated me sometimes because of the workload. It was a tough job to help them and pass a smile in order to please them. I was standing behind the counter when Jada entered the mall. She was a frequent customer. I knew her because her husband was a good friend of a colleague of mine at Costco. Jada was usually a very cool lady, and I envied her charisma. But that day... There was something weird about the way she entered. I couldn't quite place it, but I noticed the difference in her demeanor and perhaps the way she dressed. I had only a few seconds to study her before I shifted my attention back to the customer in front of me. Her hair was rolled up on her head in a bun. She was dressed in a skimpy crop top and bum shorts. It wasn't strange. People wore all manners of clothing. It was strange because of who she was. When Jada visited the store in the past, she was always collected and fully dressed in proper shoes, but her look that day resembled someone in an emergency. She walked through the store in a hurry, asking for help in finding a product from no one in particular. Perhaps our mistake was not responding to her. Maybe we considered that she was just a regular customer. Getting around wasn't supposed to be difficult, but we were wrong. She suddenly flared up, and the entirety of our attention turned to her. She looked like a crazy woman to me when she threw the first item on the shelf closest to her on the floor, then another, and another. I ran over to her to calm her down, but that seemed to cause a lot more harm than help. It was at that moment I realized that the peace from the beginning of the day wasn't peace at all. It was the calm before the storm. Jada was mad. We couldn't understand what made her react in that way. She was furious. 
She stopped and threw things on the floor and back at us. The other customers screamed as she ran past them and flung items off the shelves onto the floor. They moved away from her, unable to put her in order, and scared out of their wits. The other staff joined me in trying to calm the woman down. The store was in chaos and everyone was scared. As she displayed her anger, she repeated just one sentence. I asked for your fucking help and no one responded to me. I kept following her, hoping my big body would be an advantage and I'll be able to hold her down. Instead, she turned on me and threw items and goods at me. That was when I caught the madness in her eyes. Her eyes were red, annoyed, sparkling and fuming. I couldn't watch her eyes for long because she was back to a kicking spree. She turned on the shelves like an angry animal, kicked off more items, not caring whether the contents were liquid or solid, not caring if they were delicate like eggs. She aimed at destroying the entire store, perhaps everyone working at the store too. My attempt and the attempt of everyone else in the place was futile. She resorted to using her teeth and fingernails to cause further destruction. She destroyed the toilet papers and emptied milk cans. She threw delicate ingredients all over the place. Someone must have pissed her off. I tried to find an excuse for her behavior in my head. I could almost argue that she was possessed. Her hair was gradually getting scattered. Her legs were moving in a scattered pattern. Her eyes were lost. They resembled the eyes of a zombie fixed on its prey, empty and scary. It wasn't just Jada that scared me, it was the cleaning up, the account, and other things that we would have to do once her rioting ended. My day escalated from good to bad extremely fast. Someone must have called the police because they came in a few minutes later. Jada still wasn't calmed down. She was boiling with rage and the officers had to handle her like she was a mad woman. She kicked and jumped and fussed as they handcuffed her and dragged her out of the store. The store was a complete mess. I turned to look at what she'd done in the short period of time before the police arrived. The store looked like it was raided by stubborn monkeys or maybe vengeful ghosts. The toilet papers were scattered all over. The floor was wet and messy. The shelves were in disarray and some were almost empty. My head was a mess alongside. Jada was gone, but the damage she left behind was obvious, and my head was banging. I suddenly wished I had fallen sick that day and didn't appear into work. As we bent to put the store back in order, my head was filled with the images of the woman that made the store into what it was. As I was busy cleaning the floors, my colleague, Stacy, came to me. While Jada was busy destroying the store and abusing, she had called up her friend, Jada's husband. The husband suspected that she was possessed by a ghost, her neighbor's ghost. The neighbor had died under mysterious circumstances a day earlier. Although her husband didn't say it, Stacy said that she could sense that he suspected his wife of murder. He said that she started to act strange after that occurrence. He himself was worried about his safety and it was him who had sent the police. We cleaned the store and calculated the number of goods lost. I left work more dejected than the happy self I came in to work that day. Ever since, I made a mental note not to be encouraged by days that start so well, because they could end so bad. I had been homeschooled all of my life, but when I didn't pass the college entrance exams, my mother had no choice but to register me at a real school. It was a decision she regretted soon enough, a decision I also wish she hadn't made. Starting at a physical school after 19 years was a real hassle. Since I had never been amongst a social crowd my whole life, it was difficult to make friends. Not only was it weird for me, but... It was also weird for my classmates. Most of them had their best friends, their cliques, and I was nothing more than an outlier. The only person who ever noticed me was the teacher. I would have considered it an absurd situation, 
but it was the first time the opposite sex showed the slightest form of interest in me. It didn't matter that the interest was on a professional level at school and casual level at other places. My mother had always been so protective of me since I was little and almost got raped by my uncle. It was one of the reasons she never let me go to school and insisted to my father that I was homeschooled. The special attention the student teacher gave me didn't arouse concerns. It ignited feelings. Butterflies. I never felt that in the entirety of my life. His name was Fred, the only person in my new school that paid me any attention. He was only nine years older than I was. He took a student teaching job to help his finances. I got to know all these things through the late night chats we engaged in through social media. It was not right for a teacher and student to engage in a relationship like ours, but I didn't care. I loved that I was free from my mother's protective wings, and I loved the way Fred interacted with me. I was glad to be engaged in something that could get my mother angry, the same way I pissed her off on purpose and failed my college entrance exams. School became a lot of fun, and I didn't care that my classmates wanted nothing to do with me. In fact, I was glad that they didn't notice me or try to get in my space. I pretended not to notice them too. Fred taught me how to skip classes and go on secret dates with him. I knew I was supposed to be studious and pass my college entrance exams, but the truth was, I didn't care about school. I cared about having my own space and any life I wanted to live could be painlessly funded by my rich father. Perhaps Fred saw through me and got close to me for this reason. I wouldn't know. What I do know is that our relationship escalated. He started to ask me for money. I didn't mind. I gave it to him whenever and whatever he asked for. I was glad to be of some help to my potential boyfriend. I even thought by helping him, he would stop being a student teacher and our relationship could go on without a hitch. Due to the school regulations, we chose not to make commitments until I graduated. If we got caught, I promised to take all the blame on myself because my parents were bound to save me as usual. Anyone who knew about our relationship at that point would have rightly pointed out that I was the one putting Fred in danger. Perhaps I was also the only one throwing myself at him, but we both knew it wasn't me. It was Fred. As an innocent adult who barely knew anything about relationships, I allowed Fred to take over. He made all the rules. My first doubt about Fred came when I noticed the relationships that existed between my classmates. Mushy, lovey-dovey with lots of gifts and endearments. Nothing like it existed between Fred and I. Our relationship was nothing but sex. He took pleasure in separating my legs on every date, penetrating my innocence. I thought he was teaching me relationships, but no. He was teaching me sex and its pleasures. He was using me to fulfill his dirty fantasies, but I didn't know. Not until I refused to open my legs to him on one of our escapades. Fred was furious. He screamed at me, beat me, and tied me up. It was on that day I realized that he was nothing short of a psychopath, and for the first time in my life, I wish I had listened to my mom. I threatened to report Fred to the school authorities, and I threatened him with the name of my parents. I told him they wouldn't stand still when they noticed I was missing. He spat in my face and seethed as he told me they could never find me. At that junction, I cowered in fear. He wasn't wrong, because our actions were wrong and there wasn't supposed to be a relationship between student and teacher. We always met at an unusual place, a place away from the crowd and watchful eyes, a place where no one could ever find us or imagine we would ever be. A small cottage of which only Fred and I knew. It didn't matter how much I shouted or threatened. I was at the mercy of Fred. I thought the worst he would do was leave me tied up for a few hours and let me go. But I was wrong. He tore off my clothes and took videos and pictures of me. He beat me and forced me to pleasure him. That day, I realized that Fred never liked me. He didn't shower me with attention with genuine intentions. No, he took advantage of my loneliness and newness to feed his pocket and sexual desires. 
He was a maniac, a monster. While he committed his numerous atrocities, I regretted not listening to my mother. My mind circled back and I regretted failing the college entrance exams. My mother told me I had been missing for three days before I was found. Luckily for me, my classmates happened to know of my secret relationship with Fred. When I was missing for too long, and a report was made, they told on him, and a search was conducted until the cottage was found and I was rescued. I couldn't have known how long I was there. He starved me, but had sex with me any time he wanted, taking videos. He was arrested and I had to leave school again. But it didn't matter. I was done with schooling. I registered with a therapist, and it's been a long time since that incident, but I still shiver thinking about those days. I have developed this unwavering hatred for men. The whole male species is nothing but full of scummy douchebags. It must have been our bulgy eyeballs, but something about our new homeroom teacher bugged me. I told Shirley, but she shrugged it off as usual. Shirley had been my best friend since middle school, and though that was not too long ago, I cherished her like the apple of my eye. The only thing I hated about her was how she never paid attention to details, no matter how hard I tried to point them out to her. She usually shrugged me off as being too cautious and always suspicious of every little action. In some cases, she was right, but that didn't rule out the majority where I was usually right. For some other reason, I felt like I was right about the weirdness of our new homeroom teacher. Our former teacher died in an accident, and the position was filled in a hurry since the school year was almost running to an end, and the exam period was drawing closer. The new homeroom teacher taught biology, and her class was the most boring of all the teachers in the school, and people often avoided her. But in our case, it wasn't about avoidance. It was the fact that we would see her each day until the school year was over. The woman didn't make a bad homeroom teacher, but I hated her eyes. They were big and ominous, giving me the creeps every single time we made eye contact. Something that was compulsory for every student every time she came to take the class attendance. It was one of those times and I was telling Shirley who was beside me how making eye contact with the woman caused me to have goosebumps on my arms. She said I was overreacting and that I should get over it because the woman would leave our class soon. What she forgot was the fact that we had a biology class that morning. The woman finished with the attendance and left the class. We had the first two periods and by the third, she was back. I made eye contact with Shirley and she told me off. The class started as usual. I wrote silly notes to Shirley, reminding her of the last time I felt this way about the biology teacher. Notes in class were one of the things I loved to do with Shirley. Notes happened to be the thing that made us best friends. Shirley paid little attention this time. I couldn't blame her. The last two periods were terrible. The woman got annoyed with almost everyone in the class, and one by one she cast more than half of us from the room. But that day, she didn't cast us out. She made us write apologies. Writing apologies was not a new thing, but the weird thing was how she asked us to write the apology letter. She told us to write it like a love letter to a lover. She even emphasized the use of romantic words. It was creepy, but we did it because she threatened to give us an impromptu test if we didn't. Do you think she'll give us a test again? Shirley wrote in a note she passed back to me and I shook my head. By mentioning the test, I could tell that Shirley was worried that the woman would ask us to write another apology love letter for no reason. Some of our classmates said that she probably didn't get enough love from her husband and was using us to fill the hole in her heart, but I only thought it was psychopathic. Then one day, things turned crazy. That day, it didn't feel like the woman would cast anyone out of her class. It didn't matter if we slept or dozed off, her eyes showed some kind of depressing depth. I couldn't tell what she would do if she got annoyed with any of us in the class. I paid attention though and avoided eye contact, but I didn't have to wonder what she would do for long because George annoyed her. George was the class clown, 
the one who liked to play pranks and add some life to the class when it seemed like no one was following. I couldn't blame George for starting a prank. It was still morning and nearly half of the entire class was sleeping. Of course, we needed some life to truncate the boredom, but Miss Shelby was not having it. He pranked Miss Shelby, and rather than laugh it off like most of the other teachers did when George decided to act silly, she called him out to the front of the class. George couldn't have known what she was up to, and neither could the rest of us have guessed. She asked him to come out with his chair, and he was seated facing the whole class that was now on alert to see what Miss Shelby would do. One thing was sure, her punishments were never good. Out from nowhere, she pulled out a pair of scissors and walked over to where George sat. We watched and wondered what she would do. She held a full grip of George's hair and the entire class gasped. It couldn't be. I looked at Shirley and she muttered to me, What the heck? When our eyes met the front, Miss Shelby had cut off the chunk of George's hair in her grip. She took another grip and while cutting it off, she started to sing the national anthem. The hairs on my arms stood and goosebumps filled my skin. Shirley flipped in her seat. She was finally realizing that I hadn't been overreacting. Miss Shelby was indeed a psychopath because only a psychopath cut off their student's hair while singing the national anthem. George didn't react to what the woman was doing, but the entire class was shaking. The students gasped in horror, Shirley and I included. Miss Shelby turned on us and there was an uproar. She walked straight to where Shirley sat and took her hair, aiming to cut it off like she did George's. Shirley screamed and the students started to run out. I tried to pull Shirley out of her grip. There were screams and shouts and we couldn't even recognize when the cops arrived. Amidst all the chaos, someone had called the emergency line. The school couldn't do anything to help Miss Shelby. They were instead saddled with the duty of apologizing to the parents of all the students. Miss Shelby was handed over to the police. She was arrested and after a trial she was put behind bars. It didn't matter that George tried to prank her. Cutting off the hair of students was a crime. No one had a right to take out their frustration on us. Shirley never doubted whenever I felt eerie about someone after that. If only she had been careful enough when I told her, she wouldn't have thought I was overacting about Miss Shelby. Thank goodness she didn't lose her hair. We still talk about that scenario while reminiscing sometimes. After her arrest, rumors about her abusive father and childhood issues floated around, but nothing concrete was ever confirmed.